So the transfer portal is now open and Oregon can actually add players and uh, we've got one. But what should the biggest priorities be for Dan Lanning? Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks, which is why, if you haven't already, please continue to like, comment, subscribe wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs, helping you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. For those of you watching on YouTube, this is what the top of my head looks like. These are my ears. I do indeed have them. And that'll end it for uh, the visual tour of Spencer's body parts that you haven't seen a lot of lately. But new microphone, new look. Hope you all like it and such. So um, the transfer portal is wild. It's crazy. It's exciting. It's overall, I think, a good thing for Oregon. And as you look at this Oregon roster, I've been thinking about this more and more. I, I actually feel like there are a lot more holes on the roster going into next year than we realize. It's not completely barren or anything, but when you're just looking at experience, that's the tough thing for a coaching staff to balance is at what position do we want to add someone who we know can play at the college level versus at what position do we trust a young guy to make a step forward to so start playing at the Division I Power 5 level? I'm glad I don't have to make that distinction because it can be a really tough call. But the top priority in the transfer portal, to me, has got to be a pass rusher. Now, that mindset of mine could change if say, David Hicks or Mateo Uyunglele, you get one of them on the recruiting trail, maybe it's not priority number one, but it's still up there. You can't have a great defense without a pass rush. And Oregon's pass rush this year was pretty abysmal, time and time again. And we are losing our two best pass rushers. We know DJ Johnson is gone, but... Brandon Dorless hasn't yet announced. I've got a suspicion here that he's going to the NFL. Hasn't been officially announced. Neither has Noah Sewell, by the way. I don't expect either of them to be back. I would take them back. I 100% would. And it may, I don't know if upset is the right word, but stir some Duck fans to hear about, you know, really anyone from this defense coming back. There are top-to-bottom changes, I think it's more schematically oriented, that need to take place, but not all the personnel from this year's defense, which struggled mightily, are not worth having back. I would take Doralis back. I would take Sewell. I would take Gonzo, even though Gonzo is gone. Yeah, that's, that's, that's probably about it in terms of actual locks. I'd probably take... Yeah, I'd maybe take Jordan Riley. He did so, he did some nice things. He's uh, leaving because he's out of eligibility. But I think pass rusher has to be your number one priority because when it was a weakness all season long and you are losing at least one, probably two of your best in that particular department, arguably third, you can make the case. If no Sewell leaves, Oregon is losing their three best pass rushers. DJ Johnson, Brandon Dorless, and Noah Sewell. Go look at the sack numbers from the last couple of years. It's a lot of those guys. And it passes the eye test too. So when you're talking about development, do you want to be able to have some young players who can come in and start to make an impact? You know, does an Anthony Jones make a year two leap? We saw him at the end of the game against Colorado. Where is he going to fall on the depth chart? I don't know, but he looked all right in the limited action we saw there against the Buffs just a name to follow, just throwing it out there and such. But there's so many other question marks that even if you are going to look for the next young guy who's going to be part of the next you know, wave for 
the, the, the coming couple of seasons for who's going to get after the passer, you still need to have guys who can produce if you're going to win at a high level in 2023. Maybe Oregon just takes a step back. It's a little bit of a developmental year and everything pops in 2024. I don't know. This is why this is also fascinating to follow, by the way, because there are a lot of different holes on this Oregon roster, a lot of different needs, and so many players available. And I'm fascinated to see how the staff feels about the incoming true freshmen, about guys who are you know down on the depth chart this year but could take a step up in, in the following season versus what they need to bring into the transfer portal. But I think you need to look and find someone who you can rely on to be productive getting after the passer in the transfer portal. I, I, I think you do. It doesn't have to be someone with two or three years of eligibility. But you have to find somebody. You, you cannot just sit idly by and say, well, we trust the guys that, that we've got coming in. Well, if the guys this year, maybe one or two are ready to pop and they just need an opportunity. But if they were behind all the guys who couldn't get after the passer, I don't have a ton of optimism on on that particular front, at least at this point in time. But guys improve, guys get better. So I think that's priority number one. Priority number two. And again, when talking about the transfer portal, I'm talking about players at positions that are going to be ones of need for the Ducks, where you need an instant impact guy because there isn't a very clear succession plan or huge amount of you know depth of talent there. I think it's more important for the Ducks to go out and find a safety more than a corner. I think that's going to come as a surprise to some. Because there were stretches this year where the corners were looking vulnerable, not doing their job very well. But think about this. Early in the year, in that Washington State game, that thrilling win up in Pullman. And speaking of Pullman, by the way, fingers crossed, best wishes out to Mike Leach, who apparently had a health scare situation. Terrible. Just Really hope he's okay. He's so great for college football. But think back to that game in Pullman. Oregon was struggling to defend tunnel screens. They were struggling to defend a number of things. They struggled defending quick hitters against Georgia. Did you notice how as the year went on, that got better and better? The safeties are a part of that. But it's the corners who have to be willing to come up and make plays. And in, in games like the UCLA game, I saw guys like Triquez Bridges. I saw guys like Dante Manning. Gonzo, of course, a part of that group as well. Get better on that front. So, though I didn't love everything I saw from the corners this year, I saw a lot more holes in the defense from the safeties than I did the corners just straight up getting beat in one-on-one man-to-man coverage. Bridges had his moments for sure, but ask yourself this question. Triquez Bridges is a sophomore this year. He's a young player who's you know moved back and forth, maybe he's a guy who you need to put back at safety and elevate a guy like Jaleel Florence up the depth chart. When you think about Triquez Bridges and how often that name came up earlier this season here on the show or in your mind, how often was that? It's pretty regular, right? It was, it was pretty darn regular. As the year went on, was that as frequent? Because to me, it seems like, mm, no, we kind of talked about him less and less as the season went on. And that's what you want from a corner. You don't want to hear from him unless he's making an explosive play. But I'd rather not hear from him and have no explosive plays than hear about him a ton because he's getting beat all the time. I'm just saying, you might look at the roster without Gonzo and say, well, you need two starting corners. Like, mm, maybe you just need one. But I look at safeties, and I think there were a number of things that they could have improved upon, just like your small business can if you check out LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Go post your job. Put the purple hashtag hiring frame in your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring and watch the qualified candidates roll in. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. It's a good price. Terms and conditions do apply. So Oregon safeties this year. You're going to lose Bennett Williams. 
The futures of Steve Stevens and Jamal Hill, unknown at this point in time. They both have another year of eligibility if they want it. Maybe they decide they're done playing college football, want to try going pro. I don't think Stevens could. Hill, probably not. He's got the prototypical size, but I don't know if he's got the the speed and tape to be able to do that. But some guys just decide, hey, I want to graduate. I want to go into the workforce. I'm done playing football. So we'll, we'll wait and see on those two. But you're losing Bennett Williams. So you know that that's a position, right? Hybrid linebacker, maybe you slide Jeffrey Bossa over there. He struggled this year at the linebacker position in in a major way. But think about the rest of Oregon safeties this year. Brian Addison, I thought had some really, really nice moments for sure. And he made some big plays. I'd be okay if he was back there again. I think he did a lot of good stuff. I don't know if he's a free safety as much as I might want him at strong safety, but... Am I okay with him on the back end of the defense? I'd say yes. But when talking about Jamal Hill or replacing Bennett Williams or Steve Stevens, when I say those names, do any of you think, oh, got to have that guy back? Doesn't mean these aren't good guys. By all accounts, they are. They've played hard, committed to Oregon football, all that sort of stuff. Totally get it. We're just assessing play here. When I say any of those names... Whomst among them jumps out as a, man, really got to have that guy back. Man, I think our defense would be even worse if those two weren't there. I think when you look at all three of them, frankly, Hill and Stevens and and Bennett Williams, what they're lacking as a unit is high-level speed. And I think that that allowed them to get beat from time to time in man coverage. And, you know, maybe they were playing over the top too much, but maybe that's just the best option that Oregon had back there. But the the reason I put safety as such a high priority in in the transfer portal here for finding an instant impact guy, I think you look at Brian Addison, who's tall. He's like 6'3", 6'4"-ish. Let's look that up real quick. Uh, You know, he, he played a lot of free safety this year. He's built a little bit more like a strong safety. He's 6'5", 195. That, that's not your typical, think Verone McKinley, think John Boyette, think, you know, what are the great free safeties have, have come through Oregon? Like I blanking right now on, on other ones. Those are the two that I, that I always think of because Verone was really, really good. And, and John Boyette, that guy was a stud. But those are, you know, kind of free safety molds, smaller, a little bit more nimble, a little bit more, you know, uh, of that roaming type on on the back end. And maybe it's not what Lanning and Lupo are looking for from from their safeties in terms of a body type. But I look at a guy like Brian Addison and say, man, he he made a lot of physical plays. He's fast. He's got some some good size. Feel like that's a guy who could play in the box more, and you don't have to just play him on on the back end of the defense. But you know, you, you go down the roster here. And just keep looking at the safeties. Like, even if Jamal Hill and Steve Stevens, one or both of them, come back, you're still losing Bennett Williams. And then you're looking at guys like J.J. Greenfield and Damon David, who played pretty sparingly this year. And I don't think either of them wowed the coaching staff or us in the time that they did play. So you'd be relying on one of those guys' inexperience to be enough to, you know, I mean, they've played a little. You know, it's not like they're true freshmen who have never seen the field, guys like who I'm who I'm about to mention. But you'd just be reliant on on guys that are unproven commodities at a really important position, especially in 2022 when teams are throwing the ball all over the football field. So you'd be looking at J.J. Greenfield or Damon David, or you'd be asking a young guy to pop. You know, Trajan Williams was a four-star recruit in the class of 2022 Maybe he's ready in year two on campus. Tyler Turner and Cody DeCambra are safeties that are coming in, and those are both Dan Lanning, Matt Pallage, Demetrius Martin recruits. So maybe those are exactly the sort of body types or exactly the sort of players they're really looking for. And these other guys haven't seen as much action because the coaching staff looks at them and says, look, uh, they do some good things, but it's not exactly what we're trying to do. Maybe. But again, at a position as important as free safety, in an era of throwing the football, and they're also usually the the free safety, the guys who are barking out instructions and making sure everybody's on the same page. And Oregon had a couple coverage busts this year. I don't think they had too many, really. Um, you're, you're never going to have zero in a season. It's just asking too much of uh, of a defense and whatnot, and not realistic. But I think that I think that's a role where if you brought in a guy who you know, has played a couple of years of power five college football who understands, 
how to get everybody in order, what to do, the speed of the game, route concepts, and all that sort of stuff, rather than having to teach kids on the fly, I think that could be uh, pretty beneficial. Uh, number three priority, wide receiver. Mm. Yeah, it, it's a weird thing. I mean, maybe Ashton Cozart's ready. Maybe Jerion Dickey is ready as true freshman. That's asking a lot. Maybe Kyler Casper gets an opportunity to pop with Dante Thornton and Chase Cota uh, no longer with the team for different reasons. But you look at the you look at the receivers, and if you were going to go four wide, like as you line up today, as I record this on Sunday night, if you were to go four wideouts for Oregon. Who would it be? You'd have Troy Franklin. Duh. Chris Hudson. Obvious. And it's a bunch of like, mm, I don't know. I I don't know. I'd look at a Deshaun Stribling at Washington State. I'd look at Dorian Singer, who we offered from Arizona. I would love to get Dorian Singer. He's one of the leading receivers in the Pac-12 this year. Pretty surprised that he's in the portal. You talk about instantly replacing Dante Thornton. Dorian Singer is a great candidate for that. So, you know, maybe a true freshman like a Jerry on Dickey and Ashton Kozart. Don't sleep on Kenyon Sadiq. He's a he's listed as an athlete. He's like a wide receiver, tight end hybrid. Maybe he's able to see the fields of true freshman. Maybe he isn't. Um, I can't wait to watch him in the spring game, though, if he if he sees any action, because he's 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 got a unique physical makeup. But um those would be my top three priorities. Pass rusher, number one. And I think it's a pretty clear number one. I, I really do think it is. I think safety is right behind, ahead of corner, well over corner. I I feel better about Oregon's corners right now, which, you know, your top three are probably without Gonzo there, Triquez Bridges, Dante Manning, Jaleel Florence. I liked a lot of the things I saw from Jaleel Florence in year one. He could easily be an Oregon, uh, a starting corner for Oregon next year. I, I, easily think that I have not given up on Dante Manning, who I still think is a solid player. He's maybe not the five star that, that we hoped he would, that, that we hoped he would be. I still think he's got some untapped potential and I think he showed glimpses of it this season. And I, I, I would be surprised if the staff moved on from him in terms of the cornerback depth chart. So uh, safety over corner, I think by a lot. I think you have fewer questions there and just more talent across the board. And then wide receiver number three. I think that's where you got to be looking, but primarily on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, by the way, speaking of defense, we've got our first transfer. We've got our first transfer. I hope you weren't panicking. I don't think you were. I wasn't getting messages about it. I'm just saying, hope you weren't worried about Oregon having a bunch of guys leave the program and nobody come in because, well, you know, the portal wasn't actually open yet. But now the portal is open and Oregon is going to start adding players. And we have got our first name, Iowa linebacker Justin Jacobs who comes in at 6'4", 238 pounds. I tell you, that's some kind of size. That is that is some kind of size. He's a former four-star recruit. He will be a fifth-year senior with one year of eligibility unless, unless he's able to get a medical redshirt. He already redshirted in 2019, played sparingly for a couple of years. Career was uh, unfortunately cut off a little bit at Iowa because of an injury this year. He is eerily reminiscent of one Oregon football player in particular, who we all know very well and whose career we've all followed very closely and whose career, unfortunately, did not unfold the way we had hoped. You might know who it is. You might know who it is because he plays the same position as Justin Jacobs. I will tell you if you were right after I tell you that you are wrong if you are not protecting your home with Simply Safe. At Locked On Ducks, we believe the home should be where you and your family feel the safest, especially over the holidays. This season, give yourself and your family the gift of peace and protection with the number one rated home security system, Simply Safe. And right now, Simply Safe is offering Locked On Ducks listeners 40% off. What else do I need to say? A new security system. But don't Put this off. In an emergency, 24-7 professional monitoring agents use Fast Protect technology exclusively from Simply Safe to capture critical evidence and verify the threat is real so you can get higher priority police response. Don't miss your chance to save big on my favorite security system, the only one that I recommend. Get 40% off any new system at simplysafe.com slash locked on college. 
today. That's simplysafe.com slash locked on college. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Yeah, you may have guessed it. The the guy whose uh, career arc Justin Jacobs resembles is one Justin Flo. Now, he wasn't a five star. Excuse me. Hold on. Let me clear my throat real quick. I could edit all this out, but that takes extra time and I've got another podcast to do. So you're just going to have to deal with it. He was a four star. Flo was a five star. He redshirted in 2019. Justin Flo did not, but he didn't play in his uh, inaugural potential season on, on campus. And now Justin Jacobs played sparingly in 2020 and 2021. Then after spring ball this season for the Hawkeyes, a team that, might I remind you, knows defense exceptionally well. Some would say too well. Or they just don't know offense well well enough. He was named the starting cash linebacker after spring ball. I don't know exactly what that means, but basically they anticipated that this guy was going to be a big part of their defense in 2022. That was the expectation. You read pieces talking about his potential and where he was going to fit into the team this year. He was supposed to be one of the starting linebackers. He only played in two games. He registered six total tackles. And he suffered a leg injury in the season opener and then aggravated it for a season-ending result, unfortunately, in the game against Rutgers a week later. He did not play a full four quarters. Did not play a full four quarters this season. He did that in a couple games, though not very many, over his Iowa career. And I, I don't know if he'll be able to get a medical red shirt. He's a junior coming into this season. He got hurt. Season-ending injury after week two. Maybe he'd be able to get a second year of eligibility. But this was a guy who Iowa had high hopes for, just like we did with Justin Flo. He was discussed as a future NFL talent, just like Flo. He was expected to be a leader of the defense this year. The parallels here are really uncanny. Like, you can't make this stuff up. But at the end of the day, you look at his career, and and the Flo, I think, had more hype early on. And and Jacobs was a guy who, you know, was a was a was a well-rated recruit or a pretty highly rated recruit is a more fluid way to say that. But English is really hard. His development and the time he spent in the program is why they thought this would be the year he'd really pop. And we thought Flo, because he was he was finally healthy, would finally pop this year. And he just didn't. And it did kind of look, I had this thought the other day too, that the injuries stunted not just his ability to, you know, adjust to the speed of the game and the style and understanding plays and routes and all and coverage assignments and whatnot. Feel like Justin Flo is a less explosive athlete after those injuries, of which there were multiple. And that makes sense. He had a couple of leg injuries. Did he ever look like the guy whose high school tape you watch? Granted, he's going up against high school kids there, sure, but Feels like even from the Fresno State game a year ago, he was just never quite the same physically. And, and that's the same question I think we'll be asking here with Justin Jacobs. Is he's got the physical traits? I mean, six four, that's a really tall linebacker. Noah Sewell is six foot one. So he's six four, two hundred and thirty eight pounds. I wonder if we're bringing him in as an edge prospect, frankly. I don't know. But it's just ironic that his career in many ways mirrors that of Justin Flo, who's of course in the portal. And, and leaving the program. But Jacobs is a guy that I don't think you would bring in giving the expectations he had. And they thought he was going to come back to Iowa as well. Instead, he's in the portal and he's coming to the Ducks. I don't think that's a guy you bring in unless you expect him to be a major contributor. Now, this has not been announced, of course, but let's assume Noah Sewell is gone and assess where the linebacker room is. You've got Keith Brown, He played a lot this year. You've got Devin Jackson. He did not. You've got Jeffrey Bossa, who played a lot but struggled. I don't think his starting spot is solidified at all. I think he should just move back to being a box safety, but that's just me. I've been saying that on the show for about, I don't know, I think since I started hosting it, frankly. That was one of the things I talked about last year after the Alamo Bowl. I am excited for the Holiday Bowl, by the way. But Harrison Taggart, 
did not really play this year. I don't know if you saw any action. And Amari and Winston. And the only traditional linebacker in the 2023 cycle is three-star Jerry Mixon, who chose the Ducks over UCLA. So the linebacker room, I think there's some talent in there. I think Devin Jackson is a guy who's got that. Like That's, that's my pick-to-click, so to speak, in the linebacker room going forward. I hope I am proven right. Uh, he has elite high-end speed, and we'll see how you know he's able to work his way around the depth chart. Obviously, you have to have more than just one or two physical traits to play a lot, but I think he's got that and has that that sort of potential. But you look at the names there and say, man, that's that's not very many. There's not very much experience there. It goes back to what I was talking about with the safeties. Sometimes you need to bring in a guy at a position group who you can count on, who can be a rock, like Gonzo in the secondary this year. There were questions about Oregon on that end. You lose Mikhail Wright, you lose DJ James. Well, those were your two starting corners a year ago. And so you bring in a guy who can just be exactly what you know he's capable of being because you've seen him play. A little bit different here with Jacobs. I think this is a little bit more of a flyer acquisition because he hasn't played a ton, hasn't put together a full season, but... Iowa would not have been high on him as a defensively oriented program by accident. I don't think Lanning would either. So this is the first edition. It will be the first of many that we'll continue to cover here on the show. And then uh, I want to close with uh, just a quick note. Men's basketball is at 5-5. Five and five. Women's basketball, much better than that. The men are starting to get healthy. And we have seen Dana Altman do this before. Slow starts. I think this slow start exacerbated by the most insane list of injuries I've ever seen for a team ever at any point in time. And they played a good Nevada program that's off to a good start this year, and they never trailed. And they were in control the entire game. Starting to get healthy. Will Richardson is playing well. Knock on wood. And Folly Dante is still healthy. Knock on wood again. Starting to get guys back in the rotation, have some depth, not have to play walk-ons. Just, I'm, I'm, they haven't accomplished anything yet. They're one and one in Pac-12 play, but they're about to play four straight home games, all against winnable opponents. Just saying, we're gonna follow. We are going to follow. We'll follow the transfer portal moves as well, because I know that's what you all want to hear about the most. Whatever it is, whatever the latest in breaking news, you know we got it for you here at Locked On Ducks. Appreciate everyone listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and go Ducks!